Now, in that in that pansa, um, the, the probably the most memorable thing, and I think he talked about a lot, was um, it was a year when he his great battle in in his early monk's life came up, and that was with sexual desire. He he said, as a monk, the other areas of meditation and practice never been too difficult for him, but that was his one real 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 weakness and um, some people say that he he fell in love with the nun uh, who sewed his robe for him as well but there, there was nothing you know possibility of any anything happening there but then during the pansa he uh, doing a lot of meditation it seemed like all, all this stuff came up um, and he had great great battle um, with it um, until finally um, he, he overcame, he was having all kinds of um, uh, sexual fantasies and very, uh, very vivid images. Um, and uh, uh, you see, um, as, as a monk, and not only are monks celibate, but ev every possible expression of sexual energy is forbidden. So the more kind of extreme uh, expressions can lead to uh, what we call a Sangadi Sesa offense which is the most serious offense against the discipline that a monk could, could commit without being expelled from the order. And if you commit that, that level of offense, then um, you have to do a period of, of, of penance and it's all special practices and it's very, quite humiliating. Um, and uh, it's also a real burden on the monastic community so it is a, it's a kind of a purification that nobody wants to go through, really. Um, but um, apart from that, there are very other rules which, which support that. So the idea being you have, uh, with the, the monk's discipline, you have, let's say, like a, a number of walls surrounding the, uh, the treasure. And so the, the outward walls are the minor rules. So if you keep the minor rules, which are your outer line of defenses, then, then the enemy's never going to get into the, to the inner walls. So, so with the monk and, and relationship to, to women, for instance, the monk's not allowed to, uh, to be alone with a woman or to have any conversation alone with a woman for more, more than seven sentences. I mean, absolute um, uh, necessary communication. And so lots of minor rules are there to support it. But what it means is there's no, there's no outlet for, for sexual energy at all, even, even um, quite uh, innocent, relatively innocent. So the monk has no choice. He has to uh, look at sexual desire as, as desire. Um, as, as something that's going on in his body and mind, and he must learn to um, observe it and to see it for what it is, as something which is impermanent and not self, and a cause of suffering, with the idea being that um, sexual desire is something that can be completely transcended, completely abandoned by, by the meditator. Did, and did the child relate how he overcame these uh, sexual desires? Well, yes, because this is a, when, when teacher teaching young monks in their 20s and 30s, then often this, you know, this is a common subject that has to be um, uh, dealt with and talk, talked about a lot. And he said basically that um, he didn't have any very wise, any special techniques, but just a great deal of patient endurance mm -hmm. and just being willing to in, endure through that without acting upon it and seeing it for what it was again and again and again. And so finally at the end of this pansa he had a real breakthrough with this and then it was never really um, a problem for him after that to the same degree. And, and before the end of that, that pansa he had a, a wonderful um, dream that Ajahn Man appeared before him with a beautiful jewel in his hand and then he, he said, here, for you, take it, just see how beautiful, how radiant it is. And Ajahn Chah, uh, to hand, Ajahn Chah, he said, he woke up and his hand was like this, you know, he was holding. So after all this, got difficulties and, and struggle, then 
he had a very uh, very good experience after that.